Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Dubik, and welcome to our second showing of In the Garden. Today, I'm joined with uh, two gardening experts, uh, Erica Smith and Mary Ellen Barnhart. Um, first, I was going to tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, we're from the Montgomery County Master Gardener Par Program. We are part of the University of Maryland Extension. Montgomery County Master Gardener Program provides a number of services to the clientele of Montgomery County. We have a speakers group that goes out and gives talks to garden clubs, various other venues, a demo gardens, several demo gardens, including one at the Durwood um, location where the Montgomery County Extension office is, also one at, at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds, and we have a couple of locations down county as well. Uh, we have a therapeutic horticulture program, our youth gardening program. We also have a program that's just specialized for one-time events. We also, of course, have an Ask a Master Gardener program. And this is part of the larger Ask a Master Gardener program. We have face-to-face -face plant clinics usually, but this time, COVID, we're uh, offering uh, a couple of uh, venues online, and this is one of them. Um, during our program, uh, you, you can, you'll see a link to our website. So if you have any questions, uh, if you'd like to contact us uh, about any of the programs that we offer, if we can be support, please let us know. The other thing is that during the program, if you have any comments or any questions, please do, type those into the comment section today. We'll try to answer those today if we have a chance. So uh, first, I'd like to start off uh, talking about uh, maybe a couple of things, maybe uh, what's sort of hot in the garden. And uh, I was going to let uh, ask Erica Smith, one of our vegetable experts here with the Montgomery County Master Gardener Program, and see, see, what, uh, see what she has been observing. Okay, so uh, what's what's hot in the garden? Well, um, we are all hot out in our gardens right now, um, so I think that's going to be a bit of a theme today. And um, uh, I am actually going to be uh, blogging about how to deal with the heat. Um, I blog for the Maryland Grows blog that's part of University of Maryland Extension, so look for that on Friday. Uh, but um, I want to talk about a sort of tangentially connected subject, and that's blossom end rot. And blossom end rot is something that you see on uh, mostly tomatoes, but sometimes peppers, squash, watermelons, things like that. And um, it is not a disease. It's actually a result of uh, calcium deficiency. And the reason they call it blossom end rot, I'm going to show you a tomato here and um, this is not an affected tomato, but just so you can see, this is the stem end, and this here is the blossom end. That's where the flower used to be. And that's the end where you would see um, a blackened area that uh, starts to rot, and um, it ruins the fruit, and you have to throw it out, and it's very disappointing. Um, so like I said, what causes that is a calcium deficiency. So you would think that the thing to do is add calcium to your soil. Um, and you will see lots of recommendations on the internet for things that you can do to add calcium to your soil, like crushed eggshells and tums, and even um, um, the, the um, Epsom salts, which um, actually are uh, contain magnesium, not calcium, so they're really not going to do any good. Uh, but the other things, um, there are better ways really to add calcium to your soil if you need to. The point though is you're probably not going to need to add calcium to your soil. Most of the time our soil around here has plenty of calcium in it. Now you should get a soil test so that you can find out what percentages of nutrients you actually have in your soil. But I would guess that in most cases there's plenty of calcium. The problem is that the developing fruits uh, do not have a way to take up calcium and use it. And uh, what usually causes this more than anything else is lack of water. So the best way to deal with blossom end rot is to just make sure that you're watering your plants more often. When it's very hot outside, it, the, the plants use more water than you would think possible sometimes. And you really have to be in there several times a week watering those plants deeply. And if you do that, you will probably find that after a little time, 
um, that's not going to be a problem. Now, considering how much water we just had falling from the sky, um, blossom and rut's not likely to be a problem in the next couple of weeks. Um, like it has been, it's probably going to be more that your tomatoes are going to be cracking from excess water. But remember that in the future, that if you start to see blossom end rot, that's the best way to deal with it. Um, you can also look at which varieties you have that are developing the blossom end rot and maybe consider not growing those ones in the future because some kinds of tomatoes are more susceptible than others. So uh, that's what I have to say about what's hot, blossom end rot. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay Th thanks, Erica. Yeah. So one of the things I've noticed in the last several weeks is that there's um, this is a caterpillar called bagworms. And uh, what we're getting into is um, they have two to three generations a year. And some of these generations of these caterpillars, uh, these bagworms, um, they're, they're quite small at first. And they feed on a wide variety of plant materials. They like evergreens, but they're not exclusively on evergreens. When they first come out, most people miss them, uh, and then maybe later on, eventually, these little bagworms, what they do is they create a silken tube, and around that silken tube, they put parts of the plant they're feeding on, which protects them, camouflages them. Uh, they're hard to actually actually rip that tube apart. It's made out of silk. Um, sometimes what these, plant, uh, these caterpillars will do, they will feed in such high populations, they will literally strip all the folds of that plant and maybe move to another plant. So plant materials that I like to feed on are arborvitaes, uh, you see spruces, sometimes you see with pine trees, and, and various other plant materials. The first generation sets you up, but it's the second and third generation really become problematic. They can, again, really strip the folds of your plant. Now, if you manage the bagworms, your plant will probably more than likely come back. But what it has done, besides the aesthetic loss of all your foliage, is that it's predisposing your plant to a weakened state. So then if another stress comes in, a lack of water, overwatering, other things come in, the plant is you know, predisposed to these other stresses, and, and particularly if this happens repetitively, it can be a real problem. And one of the frustrating things is sometimes people buy uh, small dwarf conifers. Sometimes they can be very expensive. And they may kind of sneak up on you because initially they look like small little parts of the plant actually may even look like a little cone itself. So that's kind of what's around, so, you know, quite a bit um, last few weeks. Um, I think what we're going to do uh, next is kind of go look at our, our virtual mailbag. And uh, Mary Ellen's going to kind of catch us up with some of the questions that people have been asking us, uh, Montgomery County Master Gardeners, whether they're plant clinics, or things that maybe people have um, uh, sent in to our comment section since last week. What do we have, Mariel? Okay. Our first question um, is from Wanda, and she says she would appreciate any advice on how to save dogwood. Just last week, they took down three, which were 10 plus feet tall and have lost all their leaves. We, are about we have 10 more uh, that are also looking bad. And we sent a photograph of the leaf, and uh, we'd like to know uh, what it is. Okay. Well, our flowering dogwood um, is unfortunately prone to a number of diseases and insects. And some of these are not native diseases and insects, the things that have been brought over last se several years or last several decades. And... Um, and it's put a lot more stress and a lot more, uh, uh, you see a lot more problems with um, some of our dogwoods. In. So there's a number of things. And one of them actually is a disease called powdery mildew, which many of us are familiar with seeing on other different plant materials, uh, particularly on like lilacs. And uh, you now you see them on peonies. You see them on dogwood. And what this fungus does, it's kind of, you know, doesn't seem a little, maybe, maybe a real problem at first, but on some of the dogwoods, so much of that fungus is on the outside of the leaf, um, it actually will pull moisture out of its host plant, in this case a dogwood, um, and causes a, a loss of water. And so you start to see the leaves drooping, maybe curling or cupping, like you would under heat stress. So when we get these hot times, 
Sometimes our dogwoods will drop and curl leaves. That's sort of a natural response to heat stress. But sometimes this is related to the powdery mildew, too. So we've got issues with powdery mildew. Uh, we have other fungal diseases in our area around here in the mid-Atlantic. It's very high relative humidity. We get a disease called anthracnose. There's actually two kinds of anthracnose. This one is called discal anthracnose. It's very problematic to many of our native dogwoods. We've eliminated many of them uh, in our in our landscapes, in, in, in our parks, uh, and, and natural places. Um, but we also have another disease called spot anthracnose, which is a much smaller leaf spot, more, much more consistent. Um, that's a problem. There's other problems dogwoods get, and you see them suffering, and that is from uh, insects, borers, and they tunnel underneath the bark. They block the water and nutrient flow. The leaves start to drop. They start to curl. So some of these symptoms that you see, the leaves dropping, curling, maybe browning along the edges, may just be the result of lack of water, but could be other factors, powdery mildew, dogwood borer, any kind of girdling rope or wire may be left behind when the plant was planted or staked. If the plant was improperly planted, maybe the first few years, the roots really don't get out from the surrounding soil. So you see this kind of leaf curling, leaf dropping uh, at this time of the year. So take a look around at the base of your plant. Make sure that you don't see any girdling ropes or wires. Look along the trunk of the tree to see if there's any exit holes from dogwood borers. Uh, if, it, it, if it is uh, uh, from powdery mildew, um, then you, you may have a choice of possibly treating it. But more than likely, what happens with a lot of the plants that get powdery mildew, if you have several dogwoods, it's very variety dependent. So certain varieties tend to get this powdery mildew more consistently than others. So it's sort of maybe a, it's a management decision. Do you want to keep with this one plant? Um, may be very prone. So you can look for the resistant varieties. So, um, so yeah, so there's a lot going on with the dogwoods out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Our next question comes from Joan, and it has to do with uh, hydrangea. And we have uh, some pictures to show for the hydrangea. And uh, she, or she sent in some pictures. And uh, she has a problem with the hydrangeas. Both last year and this year, the plants started to get dry spots on the leaves and eventually fall off. It is very much like fall and has come in July for my plants. Soon after the plants blossom, the blossoms dry up from the center out to the sides. I'm attaching pictures of the leaves and the blossoms. Last year, there were very few blossoms. If any, in this year, three of the plants got at least one blossom and two plants didn't have any blossoms. I don't know if it's significant information, but about two and a half years ago, a big tree that was provided shade for these hydrangea plants had to be cut down. And now the plants get full sun all day long instead of just in one afternoon. And I think we have two slides for this one, or one. Oh, well, wow. okay. Well, thanks, Mariel. I think that latter part, and uh, that's what um, really helps, I think, maybe to maybe uh, to accurately maybe diagnose the situation. So trying to get as much information as you can. So when uh, folks submit questions, you know, it's good sometimes to get as much background information as you can. Um, hydrangeas, particularly big leaf hydrangeas, do like the soil site to be cool and moist. Uh, probably bright, indirect light is best. But what sometimes confounds um, things is that sometimes you'll see these big leaf hydrangeas growing in shady areas, sometimes growing in sunny areas, and sometimes the ones in the sunny areas, and that's like what's happening here. They're struggling because they're not getting enough moisture. They're not really acclimated to that site. Uh, but sometimes you'll see big leaf hydrangeas in sunnier areas, but a way they may be getting by that side is maybe the, perhaps they're at the bottom of a hill. It's maybe a little bit more moisture there, or maybe you have a gardener there who manages it, waters it needs, you know, when it needs to be watered. So probably siding the plant where they originally had it was great, 
but with the change in the environment, I think that's probably what's causing a lot of what we're seeing. But one of the things, hopefully, um, you know, people can do is by like what this client did is send some pictures, and it really, really helps. Sometimes not just the picture of the plant, but the surrounding area. Sometimes you pick up things around, or even around, right around, immediately below the plant material. You'll see some issues from uh, maybe similar plants or neighboring plants, other things like that to help them piece things together when you try to do this uh, diagnostic work. So my guess is that it's, it's a site-related issue, change in the environment that's weakened the plant, and you start to see scorch and drought. If that gets really bad, then that might weaken the plant. And then when you get heavy rains like we get now, the roots will start to rot. So later on, you come by and you say, hey, this plant died from a root rot. But real the real culprit was you know, the change in the environment, which led to the plant to be weakened. So a lot of these things are interrelated. So. Thank you, Steve. Um, our next question is from Elise, and she has, says she has, I have not nice, large, firm green tomatoes on my plants, but I just noticed I am not getting new flowers. I fertilize and water regularly. Any ideas? Sure. Um, I think that um, I told you this was going to be a theme today. I think that the issue is that it's been very hot. And there are a number of vegetables, and tomatoes are one of them, where uh, when the temperatures are hot, and particularly when we have very warm nights in addition to warm days, um, they just have trouble uh, forming flowers, keeping their flowers, or developing fruit. Um, so uh, what I'm going to say is um, just pretty much wait it out. Um, the temperatures are cooler now, so I bet that there are some flowers that are um, hanging on nicely and are going to produce some fruit, and that your green tomatoes are going to start ripening. Um, and um, we are having these um, increasing periods of, you know, every year we get, it, it's a little hotter, and we're getting these long periods of um, hot uh, weather in a row. Um this is a problem we're probably going to keep happening. Um, so some people are doing some trials with um, using shade cloth uh, to uh, put on top of the, uh, over the tomato plants to make things a little bit cooler for them. Um, so that is uh, one possibility. Shade cloth is something that you can um, order online from various um, garden vendors. Um, and, um, there, you know, there may be some uh, varieties if you're trying growing different kinds of tomatoes and you see that some of them are tolerating the heat better than others. Those are the ones to think about planting in the in the future. And just, uh, yeah, keep them well watered. That that helps a lot. OK, next, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Erica. Um, our next question is from uh, Pat and she she wants to know, is this a cicada killer wasp or something else? And it's got a picture. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah. So, yeah, the cicada killers are out. This is the, this is the time of the year, and, and their, their favorite uh, food is uh, our, our cicada. Um, we call it an annual cicada. Actually, it's a two-year life cycle, but they overlap. Sometimes we'll call it the dog day cicada, so it's long, hot summer days you'll hear them out there singing um, they'll capture these and even though it's a very large wasp cicada is a very big insect so if you ever see them catch it and they actually fly around they kind of lumber around uh, they're going to bring it um, back to a, a, a nest that they made in the earth generally on a slope uh, generally facing south and that slope usually doesn't have a lot of plant material or, or ground cover on it so she's going to put one of those down there. She's going to lay an egg next to it, and that's going to serve as a, a food source for her, uh, for her young. Now, they're generally just really interested in just finding the cicadas, but they are large. They are intimidating. They can sting you, but they're not probably going to sting you unless you have a very close interaction with them. 
you maybe do something, you're, you're working in the garden and you're working right on top of where the, the nest is. But for the most part, they're going to go do their business. They're going to leave you alone. They're a beneficial insect. They're managing the cicada population. Next year is the year we're going to have the periodical cicada. So you might want to get ready for that. One of the things you'll notice if you start digging around, notice something a little this year, you'll start to see some of the larva of the cicadas around if you dig and you plant a lot. Some now, but particularly more next spring as you're digging around in the garden. So that next year, around this time, maybe a little earlier, you're, you're going to see these guys, and there's going to be lots of cicadas out there. They're, they're the ones that are green, the ones that we see now. Um, are, 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 they're quite large, too, um, and they both sing, but next year's going to be a big year for the, for the cicadas. We're going to start seeing all those cicada recipes again, right? Oh, yes. Cicada <laughs> cooking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Steve. Sure. The next question is from Catherine. And uh, she wants to know, she says, she, I want to start seeds for the fall season, kale, mustard, bok choy, etc. But I'm not sure with these high temperatures, if direct sowing is a good idea. Is it better to start seeds for the fall indoors or wait a month and direct sow? Would seedlings well watered endure this heat? Okay, so um, so fall, uh, starting fall vegetable seedlings. This is a, um, a somewhat complicated topic, so I'm gonna divide it up into, into parts here. Um, so we're talking about the, um, the kinds of plants that prefer cool weather to grow. Um, and we're talking about things she said like kale, mustard, and bok choy. Those are all things that are in the cabbage family, what we call the brassicas. And you might also have things like lettuce. You might be trying to grow some root vegetables like carrots and beets and radishes and so forth. Um, and it is a little bit of a challenge. These vegetables prefer it to be cool outside, and it definitely has not been cool outside. Uh, we have warm air and we also have warm soil um, and so you might have some trouble getting the vegetables to germinate or if they start to grow then they might try to go to flower early because they're under stress and, and so forth. So um, there are several ways that you can um, deal with this issue and I say it's very worth dealing with by the way because those fall vegetables once um, you start harvesting them in like October, November, it gets cool outside. Maybe we have a frost that makes them sweeter and more delicious. So it's really worth growing um, fall vegetables here. They actually grow uh, better sometimes than they do for us in the spring. Um, so there are different ways you can do it. Um, my uh, favorite way really, as Catherine mentioned, is to start the seedlings indoors. And that gives you a lot of control over your environment, the temperature, and so forth. So um, uh, that's definitely worth doing, get some seed and start them indoors. Now, the way that you figure out uh, when to start a, uh, a fall vegetable, um, you wanna find out when your first, um, your average first frost is, and you can look that up online. For us, it's usually um, like mid to late October. And then you go back two weeks from that date because um, the plants take longer in the fall to grow because we don't have as many hours of, of sunlight. And then you look at your seed packet and it's gonna give you a days to maturity. And then you add that on and you're, you're calculating backwards. So that's gonna give you a, um, a starting date. And that starting date's probably gonna be around this time. It's, it's, um, it might be something that's already passed or um, it might be in August. Um, and don't worry too much if it's you know, a date in late July that's already passed, um, you can still get those vegetables in. But you really wanna be thinking about that fall gardening around this time. Um, so you can start them indoors, um, but um, to do that, if you don't have a very sunny window, you're going to want to use um, artificial lighting. So you do have to, you know, get that whole setup. Um, if that's not something that you want to do, um, you can start them outdoors. And what you would want to do then is to make your soil as cool as possible. And um, I mentioned the shade cloth before. 
um, putting shade cloth over an area where you're starting your seeds and growing your plants is one way to cool things off. Um, you want to be watering frequently. Um, when you start the seeds in the ground, you can temporarily put something over the soil to help keep it cool and moist. So once you've put the seeds in and you've watered your soil well, you could put like some cardboard down or something like that. Um, but that's temporary. That's only until they germinate. And then you're obviously going to have to take that off so they get some light and they can grow. Um, so um, then after that, it's just a matter of trying to keep the soil nice and cool. Um, so that's, um, it's a, it can be a bit of a challenge in August, but, um, it's, you know, it's worth giving that a try. Um, the third method is probably the simplest and the one that I might recommend for beginner gardeners, and that's go buy your plants. Don't start them from seed. <laughs> um, so, um, a lot of, um, garden centers will have, um, fall vegetable plants in like the end of August, beginning of September. And those have been started for you. They're growing really well and you can get them, um, just put them in the ground when the temperatures are a little bit cooler outside and they'll probably do better for you. Um, with all of these um, methods, when your plants are growing, you have to consider possible um, pests that might go after your plants. And the um, unfortunately the, the brassicas are very prone to insect pests. We have um, various caterpillars that go after them. Um, we have harlequin bugs. Um, so there are uh, reasons to try to protect your plants from those pests. And you can use something like floating row cover um, to go over your plants. Um, you could do um, careful hand picking. Um, you can use pesticides if that's um, a choice that you want to make. Um, so um, all of those things to consider. Also, our animal friends uh, like to eat them. So definitely have a fence uh, to protect against uh, rabbits and groundhogs. Um, but all in all, I'd say, yeah, definitely worth giving it a try. Um, and you could even try several different methods and see what works for you best. OK. Thank you, Erica. Our next question comes from uh, Pat Patricia, and she wants to know what is Japanese stiltgrass and how should I get rid of it? Uh, she said this question, and uh, this uh, all of a sudden my uh, grass in my neighbor's yard has changed from nice blades grass to something that looks like miniature bamboo. I'm told it's Japanese stiltgrass. It will take over everything. Why did it come now and what can be done to control it? Okay. Well, yeah, that's quite a problem for, for a lot of us uh, who have lawns. Not, not just lawns, but it, it, it's a weed and it comes into our, 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 our beds. Uh, I'm sure into other areas as well, maybe occasionally even a vegetable garden. This is an annual grass. It's, it's not native and, oh gosh, it was maybe 20, 30 years ago or so. It was brought into the United States unintentionally. It was brought in as a, it was dried up as used for, for packing material to when they shipped a, a, a pottery from, from, from Asia, probably China, brought here. And, then, and I think it came down into Tennessee or in that area around there. And it just, it's, it's blown down. So a few years back, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you, you didn't really didn't see much around here. It's moved throughout most of Montgomery County. There's probably, there's probably still areas where it hasn't really gotten established yet. It isn't, again, it's an annual, uh, but it, it's a prolific cedar. It likes um, damper sites, so maybe a little shadier. So in a lawn, if the lawn's a little bit shady, you'll see it more on the edges, maybe around where it's shadier. You can see it in the full sun. Um, Probably, if you have a healthier turf, it would probably put more of that still grass in check. So that's one of the ways to kind of manage it. If you have your health turf as healthy as you can, so that's proper mowing. You know, try to mow it at least three inches, then maybe a little higher, three and a half. Uh, fertilize it properly. Um, things like that. Make sure your soil pH is in the correct pH. That will help to manage. But even then. It, it will challenge even a relatively healthy turf. If your turf is less than healthy, it's spotty, maybe uh, it's a little bit shady, um, 
the turf grasses that we usually grow are not as competitive. So there's a void there. So the still grass comes in. It creates seed, and that seed may germinate the next year, the year after that, or the year after that. So it starts to build up what we call seed bank. So even if you remove all the plants now, before they go to seed, there's still seed probably in the soil or from nearby areas that will come up and fill these voids. So it's a real tough uh, management decision. Maybe in some of those areas, you retreat back the lawn and let that be a bed or maybe perennials or something else, maybe mulch it there. If you wish to use herbicides in Montgomery County, we um, have a new, relatively new law that really restricts what you can apply to a lawn, aesthetic lawn, home lawn there. Even though this is um, a um, plant material is um, it's not native, it's very aggressive, our options are limited. Uh, you can use uh, specific herbicides that are allowed by this law in Montgomery County. Basically, they're going to be organic type products, natural products. They are not selective to still grass and let's say leave your tall fescue alone. They will uh, uh, treat or manage everything there. So it will kill. So if you spray it into a lawn, there's bluegrass or tall fescue it will kill that as well. So we don't have anything that selectively removes that, that you can use in Montgomery County. There are a few pre-emergents that will manage that, like crabgrass, things like that, but they are no longer allowed to be used in Montgomery County. So there's no real pre-emergent. Um, there are post-emergents that are labeled for specifically for still grass, but they are no longer allowed in Montgomery County. So you're left to management, hand pulling, spot treating with some type of organic product, uh, 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 horticultural vinegar, which is a, essentially acetic acid at a much higher percentage than you would have in your household vinegar, which is usually about 3 to 5%. This might get up to about 15 20%. It does a great job, but if you spray it onto other parts of your lawn that you're trying to keep, it will kill that too. It just kills the top. It's not translocated down to, to the bottom of the root system. This is seed acid. But since this is an annual grass, that's probably going to be good. It's going to be good enough. So anyway, there's been recent law changes in Montgomery County, which limits you on what you can use to control weeds. Um, there are probably going to be new products coming out over the short term, not short term, over the long term. But for right now, it's... You're, you're limited. Uh, if you increase the amount of sunlight, that should help to create a more, more vigorous lawn. But that, that's a tough one. A lot of us are struggling with this still grass. It is, it is extremely prolific. And you, if you're not familiar with it, I think the, the client said it looks like little bamboo. It's going to come seeding out here probably another three to four weeks. You'll see a seed head. It's a long, slender, spike-like structure. At least try to manage that, remove that, maybe put that into a compost pile or something else. Even if you do it for one year, there's still seeds there from the previous year. So you have to do this for multiple years before you really see a depression in the still grass in your area. And of course, you can always be reinfested from neighboring areas. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Mary. Our uh, next question um, is from Melissa, and she says she grows elephant garlic. She grew it this year, and she wants to know how many are they different from regular garlic. Okay, well, um, I've actually never grown elephant garlic, so Melissa's uh, ahead of me there. Um, but I did uh, read up about it, and um, so elephant garlic is um, it is related to garlic. It's in the onion family. Um, and um, the uh, sources say that it's actually more closely related to leeks. But um, I tend to think of it as um, similar to shallots in the way that when it grows, it doesn't form uh, multiple 
cloves, many different cloves, the way a head of garlic will, it's more likely to form just um, one or two cloves and a big head. And this is a big head. This is like a fist-sized head of garlic. Um, and it is milder tasting than regular garlic. So if you don't like the strong flavor of garlic, this might be something for you to grow. Um, and the, the way you plant it is pretty similar to regular garlic. You would plant it in the fall and then um, it would grow, it would start to grow in the fall and then it'll stay um, over the winter and then start growing more vigorously in the spring and you would harvest it in summertime. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's very similar to uh, growing regular garlic that way. Um, so yeah, that's that sounds like um, a vegetable that would definitely be worth adding to your garden. Thank you, Erica. My uh, next question is from Mary, and she says that her lawn has large brown spots on it. I fertilize it monthly and water it every week. How can I get rid of it? So, yeah, thanks, Marilyn. Um, we, we took a look at the picture. Um, there were several pictures brought in, and they're great pictures. Um, unfortunately, it, it, that could be several things, several different things causing that. So sometimes when we uh, need to do this diagnostic work, having the, you know, pictures of the entire site relatively close up, they're great. But sometimes we really got to get close, really got to get close. We got to look at the leaf blades, possibly, maybe even several sections. That's one of the advantages when we have our other, our usual plant clinics, people could bring this in. We could look through it. We could look through this piece of sod that they brought in. So we're really relying on the pictures that we get. Unfortunately, there's a number of things that could cause this. <clears throat> so it is in large brown areas. Uh, grubs could cause this, which are the, the larval form of scarab beetles. Built several different species, probably over half a dozen or so around here. Generally, you would see some tunneling of the grubs moving up and down, maybe birds coming into the yard, trying to feed onto the grubs, maybe something trying to dig into the lawn, maybe a raccoon trying to feed on to the grubs. There's other insects called chinch bugs that like feeding in the thatch layer. That's the layer right below where the blades and or between the blades and the soil itself. If you've got a fair amount of thatch, or sort of basically it's a lot of dead roots and dead stems in there, you can get these insects called chinch bugs or sod webworms. They could be in those types of areas too. Fortunately, there are not that many insects, types of insects that feed on turf, but it's hard to uh, really see what that is without getting something closer looking at. So it's something to consider. So if you bring in a sample ever to a plant clinic in the future, or if you get a picture that's closer up, that would be helpful. One of the things we're looking for when you look at these close up pictures you want to look at the area, not where it's brown, but right next to it, because that's kind of where you're going to see this transition. Uh, sometimes you pick up, that's where the insects are moving out from where the turf is dead. There's no longer food really there. You move into healthier portions of the turf. But you also, in that area, you might see on the grass blades themselves, there'll be lesions or spots. It's from these lesions or spots or these symptoms that we see that we make the diagnosis of is this a turf grass disease? It's possible you could have more than one thing going on. One of the big diseases that are out there uh, is brown patch. And some of these diseases, like brown patch, really affect a certain type of turf grass. So knowing which type of turf grass your lawn is predominant, that will be very helpful. As opposed to tall fescue or bluegrass, zoysia, what have you. So getting kind of close looking for those lesions, trying to figure out what type of turf you have and the time of the year too. So certain things you see in the spring, certain things you see in the summer, certain things you see in the fall. Pulling all this together, the symptoms, the time of the year, the type of plant we have, then we make the diagnosis. We say the symptoms are, and just long description, is consistent with that of brown patch. Here are some things that you can do. Again, in Montgomery County, you're very limited to what type of pesticides, fungicides you can use in the lawn. There are some things, but it's very limited for that. So hopefully what we can do is to manage your turf without going into that direction. So that, again, that goes back, having your turf grown, proper mowing height, full sun, good air circulation, 
Also, genetic diversity in your lawn. Certain varieties of turf grass may become susceptible to a disease. So maybe switching to a different variety, trying to mix it up, having that little bit of genetic diversity in your lawn. So if something does get hit by brown patch, it doesn't take out your entire stand. So it's it's hard. It's a great picture the client sent, but sometimes we just we, we need a little more information. So and sometimes people can um, um, uh, help us out by just getting a little bit closer uh, picture. That would be very helpful. So. Uh, that last question I have: Do we have anything from the chat, John? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's check. Let's check. And see if we have anything from the, uh, our comment section. Beth. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, well. There could be a um, there could be a number of different causes for that. What I mentioned before about the high heat and uh, the difficulty forming flowers, um, that could be one of the reasons. Um, aside from that, um, I would really want to know uh, more about um, the um, the conditions that they're growing under and, um, you know, how have they been treated in terms of water and fertilizer and so forth. Um, but um, going on just a little bit of information, I'm going to guess that it has to do with the heat that we've been having and that um, things will probably improve. Beth, I don't know. Do, do, is there anything else? Is there Okay. Okay. So, you. all right. Thank, thank you, Beth. Um, so that, I guess that's it for this session of uh, In the Garden on Facebook Live. And uh, please join us again. Uh, our next uh, session will be on August 18th at noon. Um, I think one of our following title slides will have you information about if you need to reach out and contact us. If you have any questions you want to send to us, please feel free. And we'll try to put, put that on our next session. Again, thank you for, for, for joining us and on behalf of Erica and Mary Ellen and Bev. Uh, thank you.